Latinx psychologists face unique challenges throughout their academic and professional journey. Many Latinx psychologists are faced with the dualities of navigating their cultural identity and, through that, the power of language. Consider the challenges when Latinx psychologists are working with Latinx clients or populations in which English is a second language, and yet there are currently no formal guidelines in the translation of clinical concepts. Are there programs that can support the development of Spanish language in a clinical practice context? And how might Latinx psychologists unite together so they are not alone in being the only bilingual psychologist, as often that is the case? Welcome to People of Color in Psychology, the show that explores mental health topics specific to culture, diversity, and communities of color. I am your host, Jack Zen. For our Hispanic Heritage Series today, we have Dr. Elisa de Vargas, a licensed psychologist in New Mexico. Dr. de Vargas currently works in the academic center providing full-time clinical services to children, youth, and families. Additionally, she serves in multiple professional roles. Dr. de Vargas is a clinical supervisor for the APA accredited New Mexico Clinical Psychology Predoctoral Internship Program, an early career professional representative for the National Latinx Psychological Association, and a mentor in the NLPA Mentorship Program, as well as the chair of the Bilingual Issues and Latinx Mental Health Special Interest Group of NLPA. As part of her clinical and training philosophy, Dr. De Vargas provides linguistically and culturally adapted evidence-based interventions to patients from a variety of cultures. In the area of training, Dr. De Vargas draws from the reflective local practice and the multicultural developmental supervisory models. As a queer bilingual Chicana, Dr. De Vargas will be discussing the importance of bilingual psychologists uniting to support each other and to create guidelines for bilingual practice. Dr. De Vargas, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me and thanks so much for inviting me. Can you share with me, how did you even get into this work? Yeah, so I grew up not speaking Spanish, but it's a part of my cultural heritage. So I always heard it from my grandparents. My dad is fluent in Spanish. My mom wasn't so confident in speaking it, but she could understand it and, you know, respond to a full conversation. And so growing up, I always was a little bit resentful that I didn't speak Spanish. And as I got older, I got really good at listening and paying attention because the way that Spanish was used when I was growing up was it was the language that the adults used to talk about things they didn't want the kids to know about. And so they could have their full conversations in front of us and be more or less confident that we weren't going to understand. So I was a little sneaky and I liked to observe and watch people. And so over time, I started understanding more and more. And that led me to study Spanish in my undergraduate. So I double majored in psychology and foreign languages, specifically in Spanish. And then I completed several study abroad programs to further develop my skills. And so when I decided to go further into my doctoral studies, I sought out a program that had some support for bilingual training, including some researchers who were investigating Latinx mental health and so forth. Oh, wow. Wow. I mean, that's uh, quite an amazing journey that you've taken, which is to try to reconnect with the language, particularly in, in your culture. Now, may I ask, what were some of the barriers or challenges that made it difficult for you to learn Spanish even at high school or middle school level? Yeah, it's interesting because I took Spanish classes throughout my elementary, middle, and high school career. It was required, 
but oftentimes it felt very repetitive. The focus was on how to conjugate verbs. We didn't really get past the present tense and the past tense. And the teachers only spoke to us in, in English when we were supposed to be learning Spanish. So that was one of the things that was really frustrating growing up. But where I grew up, it's in northern New Mexico, so kind of near Santa Fe. That's a place where some people might recognize the name of. There's also very much pride in our American identity as being multi-generational American citizens. And so I think by my generation, there was some racial trauma and oppression that had happened that kind of pushed my parents' generation to stop using the language and passing it down. So my dad would often get punished for speaking Spanish in school. He would get, you know, hit with a ruler or get oh, detention. And so honestly, in among my cousins and siblings, there aren't very many of us who speak fluent Spanish. I would say we all speak very fluent Spanglish, and that is a third official language of New Mexico. <laughs> I would say, but it definitely was a little bit of a battle for me to get to the point where I am right now, where I can speak it fluently, confidently, and kind of switch between English and Spanish, um, which is like my new milestone that I've reached is being able to switch back and forth confidently and to be able to joke in Spanish. Those were big feats for me. It took me some time. Wow, you, you really made it a mission. And so much so that you are also mentoring people and, and coaching and training them. Yeah. Now, I think the other phenomenal thing you mentioned is you specifically sought out doctoral training programs where the faculty members were doing research with their Latinx community. And you also, you were exposed to Spanish in that context as well? I was. I feel like I'm one of the few people who has been fortunate to go to a graduate program that did have some support and language training for bilingual psychology students. So in my first year of graduate school, the program that I was in, it's University of Oregon Counseling Psychology, they were in the midst of developing a curriculum and getting it officialized to have a specialization in Spanish language services and research. And so by my second year of graduate school, there was a faculty member who was approved and all of the credit hours assigned and guidelines as to what was needed in order to reach that specialization by graduation. So when I started my practica, I worked hard to be in contexts where I could use my language skills, as well as, you know, do studying and learning about different cultures, because all of Latinx and Hispanic and Chicano worlds are so unique and different that I quickly realized that my context um, was just a small piece of it. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, taking on that sense of cultural humility, that even within your lens and experience that there's still nuances with or each group in the Latinx exactly. community. Yeah. yeah. And so the, something you've actually written about and spoken about is the adaptation of evidence-based interventions to patients in the Latinx community. Can you share with me what that might look like? I think in the context of say, bilingual practice or Latinx community, how do you personally implement that? Yeah, it's it's pretty complex because when you add in the language factor and me working with children and families, there's often varying levels of language ability across both English and Spanish. And so oftentimes I'm navigating those borderlines between fluency, non-fluency, as well as having family members understand each other and be able to talk and communicate with each other. So within the context of working with bilingual patients or clients, it often is helping them to find ways to communicate effectively with each other, particularly across generations. Where I work, I often 
work with grandparents who are raising their grandchildren. So we've got two generations gap and an assimilation difference as well with oftentimes parents or grandparents being first generation immigrants and the children being first generation US citizens. So we're navigating the challenges of maybe children not wanting to learn Spanish or having a rebellious phase in their development where they just refuse to speak it. And then parents who are also, or grandparents who want to hang on to their home country's language and cultural t traditions and so are having a hard time letting that go and really trying to immerse themselves in English speaking settings to learn that. And it's also a big challenge because oftentimes these communities are siloed where they don't often have opportunities to learn English in, very easily. So the kids serve as their interpreters and often take on very adult roles early on. So in addition to the language piece, what I often find with my Latinx, Hispanic, and Chicano communities are that religion and faith is an extremely crucial and important part of identity and often a very healing aspect to bring into therapy. So talking not only about how faith and prayer or religion can help during times of difficulty, but also ways in which it can help support the enrichment of community and support systems so that people remain surrounded by protective factors as well. Additionally, some of the things that I try to incorporate are like art activities or things that might relate to some of their cultural practices or traditions. In New Mexico, we have a lot of families and communities who use art in different ways to express historical experiences as well as personal journeys through their mental and physical health. And so I find that to be a very powerful medium, particularly because within Hispanic Latinx communities, sometimes it can be very vulnerable to expose your family or to expose the details of something that occurred because we want to protect our family and we also want to protect the privacy that is so important to us. And so using art or other nonverbal forms of intervention are also really helpful adaptations that I've found to create powerful changes with people. Huh. Thanks for sharing that because as you're describing the whole approach to how you're even implementing therapy, in many ways it is challenging many folks' assumption, which is a one-on-one -on -one sitting where you're talking to the client and basically getting into the client's uh, worldview verbally and assuming they have to be able to express that to you. And you're actually creating a safe space where they can process the emotions on paper through action, through visual representation. And it's a very private experience for them as you're guiding them through that. Yeah, what I find is by not pressuring somebody to open up too quickly, by moving along with them in that process, it helps to build trust. And with marginalized communities, trust is really important because oftentimes healthcare systems or other larger systems have not treated them very well or not given them good experiences. So. I feel like my duty is to first gain trust, help them to understand that I'm here for them. I'm not going to force them to follow my agenda. And then also working with kids has taught me that there are times when we just don't have the language or the words to describe what we're experiencing. And that's true for adults as well as kids. And it's important to be able to work with people when that's happening and not just shut it down because they can't put words to it. Speaking of kids, have you noticed any trends that, you know, just based from your own experience over the years, things that you've noticed that's been coming up? Yeah, well, I can say it's been an interesting experience for me during 
the height of the pandemic shutdowns, I was actually primarily working with adults in a setting where I worked with lots of refugees and immigrants. So the concerns that I was seeing on that end were so drastically different from what I saw returning to working with kids and adolescents. So I went from, you know, talking with adults about housing issues or immigration issues to then talking to kids about school violence. And that's been a really big theme since returning to in-person school after the pandemic. We have had prejudice that has come up over these last few years. So bullying related to culture and ethnicity or related to social status and so forth. Wow, I can't help and just wonder what that is like for you to go beyond doing one-on-one individual therapy interventions because you're also addressing peripheral issues like violence at school, which I believe includes bullying and possibly gun violence and on top of that, helping children and families translating everything that is going on. Yeah, it can be very heavy duty sometimes. I didn't anticipate the amount of conversations I would have about violence at school and feelings of lack of safety at school. And so I think one thing that has shifted for me is that this is a new normal. And so it's something that I've started to just kind of incorporate into my regular practice to ask about. I've had five, six, seven-year-olds come in freaked out because they've had a drill at school. And so it's not just in the high school. It's as, as little as these elementary school kids having to go through the drills and preparations, not knowing sometimes if it is a drill or if it is actual reality of danger. So it does become pretty heavy duty. I feel fortunate to work in my setting because there's a team of providers that I can reach out to and debrief with if I have a tough session or something that really draws up a lot of emotions for me. And then for me as a provider, I always advocate for us seeking our own support, particularly through therapy and other healing methods. So I see my own personal therapist. I love her. She's been my biggest support for quite a while now. And then I also do other things for myself. I make sure that I take care of my health because it's sometimes, you know, trying to be empathetic, we are putting ourselves in their shoes and it can be really difficult to separate that from our own experience. And so for me, these other things that I try to do to balance my life help to separate it a little bit so that I can say, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to leave this at work and go home and take care of myself. Mm. And it's important because you're not doing this alone, this support. Yes, which support. Yeah, which I, I think ties to your primary message too with our, our episode today, which is bilingual psychologists uniting together to support each other and to create guidelines for bilingual practice. And it sounds like as you're describing these experiences, it goes beyond just translating the language back and forth. You're really bringing in some of the peripheral issues that may come up with the Latinx community. Like you said, there's uh, racism, there's bullying that's happening. So can you tell me a bit more about what the guidelines might involve or what that even looks like? Yeah, well, that's very much in the preliminary works. We've just had some small conversations so far, and there's actually another group within NLPA that's taking charge of that. So we're in the process of creating a task force that is hopefully going to offer some guidelines of how to support bilingual students through their training and also how to establish different levels of support within graduate programs. However, I feel like in terms of my personal work and the ways that I've tried to address, you know, building up that community and advocating for bilingual providers is we're coming up to the one year anniversary of the National Latinx Psychological Association's Spanish Consultation Group. This is a clinical consultation group that I launched last year in Denver when we had our annual conference 
And from there, we transitioned it to a virtual meeting where we offer support to bilingual clinicians every six weeks. So it runs throughout the year. And um, we welcome students as well as licensed professionals. This is a space where people come, they bring questions that they have about cases, some of it's related to culture, some of it's related to just how do I deal with this problem. Some of it's like I'm the only bilingual provider where I am and I'm really drowning. I don't know what to do. So I'm. this is an effort that I'm really extremely proud of and I think has been a huge success. And it came from that feeling that we need a community because oftentimes we are the only one where we work. And that's true for myself right now. I'm the only bilingual provider in my clinic and it can be a challenge sometimes. I'm very isolating. Gosh, it's isolating and, and you're swamped. You're the go-to for yeah. all these questions. Yes, I, I was approached actually on yesterday to translate a document. And so again, sometimes it's not even clinical stuff that we discuss, it's professional development things that we consult about. Well, I keep getting called into these roles that are not my job. How do I set boundaries? And so really providing that space for the bilingual psychologist community and beyond to yeah. find that support that is really it seems like it's really needed over these this last year. We've had such a great response that just reinforces like this was a gap in our training and in our field that really needed to, to be addressed. Well, I am so glad you're providing this resource and support for other psychologists and mental health providers. So as a woman of color, what were some of the challenges that you faced and overcame that you would be willing to share with our listeners? Yeah, I've been thinking about this question and trying to figure out the best way to answer it because there's a lot of different things that I could think about. But one of the greatest challenges was not having a whole lot of guidance through the process of looking into graduate school, understanding what graduate school even is, and how to be a competitive candidate to get in, first of all. So the GRE, which is the graduate record exam, that's this horrible test we all have to take. That was just the death of me. I was convinced that I was going to have to give up on what I wanted to do. So I really, I struggle with standardized tests, and I recognize that those tests are not standardized for me. And so it was a big challenge for me. I had, and it's costly. So one thing that I've reflected on in my college career and my graduate school career, and now my professional career is that growing up in my community and with my experiences, I'm a planner. And the reason for that is because I felt like in order to reach where I want to go, I have to really make sure that things fall in place. So finances, that was something that I always was really scared would be a barrier for me. And so applying to tons of scholarships, trying to make sure that I had kind of a pillow to fall back on if I needed to, but then also the responsibility toward family. I recently watched the interview that Dr. Tama Bryant did for Hispanic Heritage Month with Dr. Luz Garcini and Cynthia de la Fuentes. So really two big psychologists in Latinx mental health. And they brought up how us as Latina women have a greater burden is not quite the word I want to use, but a greater expectation to engage in caregiving within our families. And that's not just with our own children and immediate family, but it can often include extended relatives. And that's something that I definitely experienced, particularly in my graduate career and then at the beginning of my professional career. In my second year, my mom was diagnosed with stage four cancer, well, the summer of my first year. And I had the difficult decision of whether or not to go back to school. Oh, um, living out of state 
was really challenging for me in and of itself. I had never lived out of New Mexico and so far away from my family. And then to have my mom really sick was terrifying. She's a single parent. I grew up with, with a single parent. I do have a very good relationship with my dad, but my mom was my number one person. And when she got sick, she lived alone. Fortunately, we have lots of extended family who was always over and helping her. But to be so far away and to know she was all by herself was a really big challenge for me. And ultimately, I did take a leave of absence to care for her during the last several weeks of her life. And, you know, going back to school after an experience like that, it shifted my thinking and my approach to graduate school. And it also made me realize that it's okay to take my time and to ask for help, which is something that I never thought was possible. I never even knew that people could ask for extensions on an, on an assignment. And so I think if I had mentors or people ahead of me who were telling me that, I may not have taken on so much and tried tried to do so much on my own. But that definitely was a huge challenge. And like I said, going into my career as well, my sister became really ill. And I did not at the time have access to sick leave or annual leave because I had just been hired. So I had to take almost a month off without pay. And this was directly after postdoc. So obviously I wasn't like rolling in the dough or sitting comfortably, but it was what I needed to do for my family and for my sister at the time. And I was really scared that I might lose my job or that I might, you know, be looked at differently for not being at work or not being able to handle it, these things in a certain way or maybe, you know, showing up to work and getting emotional on whether that would look unprofessional. I had my first experience of having to turn down a client because of how closely it hit to what I was experiencing at the time. And so much of me felt scared about how that would reflect on me as a professional. And a lot of it had to do with some of the fears of like stereotypes of people who look like me and whether or not I deserved to be in that role or position. So that's just a little bit of some of the challenges that I faced. I think I could definitely speak to, you know, seeing peers of color really struggling, getting negative feedback from their advisors, and then us really rallying around each other to help each other. And I think if it wasn't for the students in my program and the way that we represented our community in supporting each other, I don't know if I could have finished my PhD. Dr. Tifatikas, thank you for sharing that with me and also our listeners. It really speaks to just the importance of thinking about support systems when you're pursuing graduate school and it really you're faced with this challenge, do I pursue this career? And then how can I also be there for my family? And, yes. and we hope it's a no brainer, but you were put in a position where you had to choose or there's this internalized pressure to have to choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh. I remember telling my graduate school advisor that I was going to take some time off of school and her response to me well was like well I hope you come back as soon as possible and in my mind I knew that the only way I would be back is my mom passing and so when I heard those words and understood like she doesn't fully get what I'm experiencing right now it was really hard because I did feel that. And my mom was also like, don't leave school. And, you know, she wanted to push me. And so, so many different conflictual messages, but really feeling like I needed to be there. And I'm really glad that I did. And somehow I ended up pushing through and graduating on time with my cohort. I don't know how that happened, <laughs> but it did. And so I'm really thankful that I was able to do that and recognize it wasn't going to stop me from reaching my goals. 
Well, Dr. Devotkas, do you have any other final thoughts or messages for our listeners? Some of my final thoughts are, you know, just thinking about the resource that I mentioned earlier. I am trying to promote this resource as much as possible. Currently, we're offering it for free. We've been offering it for free for anybody who's been interested for the last year. We are, however, thinking about transitioning to requiring people to be NLPA members starting in the new year. And so we want to encourage everybody to, one, reach out if you are interested in receiving and engaging in Spanish consultation. We spend a whole hour only speaking in Spanish and using clinical Spanish. So it's a really great way to build your vocabulary. It's a great way to hear different accents. We have people who are joining from all across the country and sometimes even Puerto Rico. So we get the whole gamut of experiences, dialects. And even if you're not fluent, I invite people to just sit and observe. I've had several colleagues who have reached out to me and they're like, well, Elisa, I'm not fluent, but I hope to one day be there. Okay, great. Come in, listen, learn, and see how you feel. Maybe one day you'll be able to speak up in the meeting and share and use those language skills. So I really want to highlight that. I also want to say that our special interest group with the NLPA is in the process of developing a library of resources. One of the biggest challenges with being a bilingual provider is not having access to tools that are translated in the language. And oftentimes the things that aren't translated aren't done so in the best way. And so we are trying to have a place where people can go access handouts and worksheets, books, resources, podcasts, whatever could help you in being a better and more supported bilingual provider. That is our goal. So that is in the works. It's not quite been rolled out yet, but we hope to have that available soon. And then, we, like I said, we've got lots of things underway. We're hoping we can help give guidance to graduate programs who are interested in developing bilingual training or supporting bilingual trainees and just want to be available for anybody who is interested in working with Spanish-speaking clients. Well, I hope folks who are listening to this participate and sign up to be an NLPA member. That'd be fantastic. Yes. We, we are always looking for new members. We have an awesome mentorship program. I've benefited from the mentorship program, both as a mentor and a mentee. I really feel like the NLPA community is supportive and a good place to grow as a bilingual provider. All right, Dr. Devadikas. Well, thank you very much for your time, your effort, and the courage that you have shown throughout your experience Again, thank you. Thank you. I hope you liked this episode. Please subscribe and share. We'd love to hear from you, so send me a message on LinkedIn or email. The People of Color in Psychology is brought to you by the Multicultural Counseling Institute, and I'm your host, Jack Zinn.